everywhere Geronimo go, people notice him. Geronimo. 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 Bantamweight Geronimo Bai had an eye for gold, and with a combination of speed, power, and tenacity, seemed destined to find it. He was a slick boxer. He was made for the amateurs. He could put combinations together really lovely. He had such good reaction time that it was hard to hit him. Geronimo was uh, someone who could have been the Manny Pacquiao before we even had a Manny Pacquiao. Someone who uh, could have taken the boxing world by storm. This is his picture in his first baseball. She came home and showed me this uniform. And uh, she's like so excited to be a baseball in team. And she even put a safety pin on it because she's too small, skinny, and the uniform is wide, so he put safety pin on it. Just to make it fit on his waist, in his waist. So. She's quiet and uh, I think she's a little bit shy. In the... I came from uh, Zamboanga and Jeremo born in Zamboanga. I don't know how old is he when he came back over, but I know he born 1969 and we came here in 1975. And then we moved to Bishi Housing and uh, we we're close to the Astoria, Astoria Hotel. When she's young, there's so many kids, bad kids around, you know, like in the school. Sometimes she come home even like running because she said oh the kid wants you know hear him like that beat him up so she, since that she said maybe i stay in the gym to be out of trouble something like you know so she said to avoid those kids she just want to go to school and gym like that Uh, the downtown east side uh, is, is you know, just dotted with these uh, old buildings, brick buildings, big, tall, small, wide, a multitude of them that have uh, some very interesting histories. Part of the downtown east side uh, lore is the Astoria Boxing Gym. You know, it's it's uh, further east from Maine and Hastings, and uh, there's a lot of people who've gone there to try to uh, you know, take up the, the athletics, the uh, challenge of boxing, and people that have gone there as well just to uh, get rid of the frustration. And there's a lot of great stories down there as well. You know, Manny Sobral, you know, the late George Angelo Mattis, uh, Jack Duke, a lot of people there who have seen a lot of boxers come and go. It was like a, a gym out of another era. I mean, it, I'm sure you've seen it. It's, it's uh, like you've gone down into a, a movie from the 50s or something. It's a uh, like complete time capsule. It's a gym, you know, it's not it's not a fitness center. You're coming here to learn because it's not big enough to have a you know to have a fitness center. We everybody that we get here we want them to compete. There's no bullshit at the Astoria. It's very although it's sometimes it can be rough if you're not ready to participate and work hard. 
I think people are mean at this story. If you don't want to work hard, like just fuck off and get out of the way, pretty much like you're wasting space. George Angela Mattis is one of the guys who started the Astoria with his friend Jack Duke back in the 70s. And, and he was a boxer too. His brother Alex was a boxer. But then George was the lawyer. And, uh, and then when we'd have that big fight card at the Italian Community Center, George would get all the, the lawyers, the judges, and the Hells Angels to come to that fight card, the dinner card. That was a night that, you know, there was no, everybody was part of the thing. It wasn't, it wasn't you're going to get somebody, it was just to come and see the fight card. I heard they said George Angel Matis tried to help, helping kids, you know. So when, Joe, when he met Geronimo, he's the one who always found Geronimo to come in the gym. He's a very nice guy. And then he become, before he died, he become a jazz, I heard, yeah. I would, I would guess the article was around 89, 90, something like that. And I believe the title was something like uh, the f battling barrister, or the battling judge or the fighting judge. I, I can't remember the actual headline on, on it, but it, it, it revolved mostly around uh, this judge who was also a boxing coach and uh, who worked out of the, and ran the Astoria with his brother. They basically kind of uh, managed things down there. So it was kind of an interesting story in that, in that respect. I remember George telling me uh, a story that I do remember him telling me because at the time I've always been into somewhat into fitness myself, but I remember him telling me that at that time, triathlons were growing in popularity and uh, he would get triathletes coming to the gym who thought they were super fit and they wanted to go in the ring and, and to spar for a couple of rounds with, to see how they did because they thought they were really strong and fit. He said they'd get into the ring with you know one of the Astoria boys and they'd be completely exhausted in a round. They just had no idea what was involved in the kind of uh, effort and tension that you have to mount to, to be in a, in a boxing ring. And uh, he said that it was a real wake-up call for them. coaching down here helping George Angelo Mattis for about a month when uh, Geronimo showed up with a bunch of other kids, around 14 years old, something like that. Well, he hadn't boxed at all. I showed him how to box on the bag for two or three weeks. And uh, he had his first fight about a month later, I, I would think, something like that. As well as I can recollect, that's quite a while. Good hand-eye coordination, so And he had the ability to learn. Oh, it's good. He looked like an accomplished fighter, his first fight out. He won his fight quite easily, actually. And he was on about 14 years old, but he, he won it quite easily. Oh, he's, he turned out to be a fine, good fighter. I mean, it was, couldn't, I couldn't predict the future in one month or uh, two months that I trained him. But he had all the qualities of being a, a great fighter, actually. Being, having, uh, being athletic to start with, having a desire to win and willing to train. I saw him, a couple of fights he had. He was very good and quick and just great. MMA 
Thanks for all uh, fighter of uh, Spanish Canadian background who is fighting with the Canadian team in the 1980s, uh, went to uh, Seoul, the Seoul Olympics. Uh, he eventually became known as Manny the Teacher Sobral because he became a school teacher. He also became someone who was a role model to a lot of other younger boxers, uh, a trainer, a teacher. He really is someone who is keeping the game alive in many ways here in Vancouver, um, you know, helping promote fights, helping uh, you know, find and, and identify the younger boxers, and also someone who is a bit of a link to the old days. Well, I was born in Spain, but I came to Vancouver when I was six years old to East Van and been living there ever since 1974. Boxing was sort of an accident for me because when I transitioned from grade seven to grade eight, started getting interested in girls and I was a chubby kid so in order to lose weight I had to go to the gym so I just looked in the yellow pages for a boxing gym and the closest boxing gym to, or not boxing gym, just a gym, and the closest gym to my house was at Maine and Hastings called the Inner City Gym and it, uh, I just wanted to go lift weights and I knocked on the door and it wasn't open yet, I went there at 11 in the morning and then um, the guy answered the door and said what do you want and I said oh I want to lose some weight, how are you going to do that? And uh, so I'm gonna lift some weights. No, you're not, you're in a box. So he taught me how to box, and that's how I started. That's how boxing started. I got really passionate about it, and uh, next thing you know, and uh, that was in uh, July. By September, October, I had my first boxing match, and uh, I lost to a kid named, from, named Deep Butter from Maple Ridge, and that inspired me to even train even harder, so I did. Uh, well, the inner city gym was a pretty serious gym because there was a guy named Gordy Rousset who was a world-ranked heavyweight that trained there and there was a guy named Johnny Herbert who was a welterweight that trained there and it really inspired me to do well. But the problem is, in, well, going back to school in September, my parents wouldn't let me go down there at night because Maine and Hastings was kind of a dangerous area. So I ended up going to the Hastings Community Center Boxing Gym, which was near Renfrew and Hastings at the Hastings Community Center and I trained there, but it wasn't nearly as competitive or as serious because kids there's a lot of kids and there's a foosball table and different things to do whereas the inner city gym was just strictly boxing and weight training and so I went back there the next uh, summer and then I stayed at the inner city gym for a while until it closed and then I ended up going to the Astoria Boxing Club which is a real serious boxing club in the basement of the Astoria Hotel on East Hastings so I got serious about boxing is what happened. Well, Geronimo and I met at the Astoria Boxing Club probably in 1983 or 1984, or probably 84. It was probably around 1984, and that's when Geronimo just started. Geronimo was about a year younger than I am, and I'd already been boxing a bit, and he just sort of started boxing. And uh, not only me, but everyone in the gym knew Geronimo had an amazing ability to box because he had incre incredible reflexes and incredible um, distance, and he knew pretty much uh, he was just a natural. <laughs> We were all really admired his abilities and how good he was and how funny he was to be around because he never took anything seriously. Geronimo was always just about having fun. Geronimo was all about having laughing and joking and playing tricks on you and just having a good time. And Geronimo, that's just the way he was, right? Never really took anything seriously. So lightened everything up is what Geronimo did. The big winner overall was the Astoria Boxing Club of Vancouver, which sent seven boxers to the final and finished with six championships, including 1988 golden boy Geronimo Bai in a 119-pound senior division. Bai was awesome as he swarmed over Tacoma's Tim Curley, throwing a flurry of combinations and forcing the referee to stop the contest at 129 of the second round. For Bai, it was bittersweet revenge. I wanted to hit him some more, he said. He beat me twice before, but I had only 10 fights the last time I met him. Boxing events, there's something spine tingling about them. And I do remember that evening being very intense and uh, because of the local talent. And there was a lot of hype around Manny Sobral and, and Geronimo Bai. And I do remember that much about it. And later on, when she started going to like work in the gym to be a, like unboxing, that's the time I cannot mostly see him, you know. And uh, I didn't even know that she have a dream to go like to compete boxing. I thought he just like to learn how to box, 
And later on, I, I'm looking for him. I said, where is Geronimo? So we, I have to phone Astoria, the George. I said, do you know where Geronimo is? He said, oh, he didn't tell you. He went to uh, go a fight somewhere. I don't know where they gone for a week, something like that. So that's the time I find out, oh, she's really good. In, she's really doing boxing and thinking like that. She always in the, you know, newspaper, like in the sports. So that's the time I learn how to learn, look for the sport in the newspaper. I just want to see his name. And sometimes if you're like talking about the way he barks, he said, she doesn't want us to talk about it. They said, don't say anything. She doesn't want to mention it to people that, oh, my son is a boxer, like that. She said, no, she, want, she doesn't want to hear that. No, sometimes we'd be in California one month and then Regina, Saskatchewan the next month and the national championships in Ontario the, the month after that. So sometimes, yeah, a lot of times, We'd have five or six or seven trips a year, and um, that was probably for two or three years that I was with Geronimo, like from 1986 to 89. 89 when we uh, traveled to Cologne, Germany together, and uh, had a real good time, and I'm not sure if Geronimo won the tournament, but he came close, I'm sure. He won a couple matches, and um, just had a great time. And, he was always partying and having a good time, always talking to the girls, and it was good. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest speaker at the 4th Annual Niagara Sport Commission Awards Breakfast is Mr. Mike Strange. Term negatives into positives. And the thing is, life isn't fair. And everybody in this room obviously is going to go through something where you're going to get laid off and you shouldn't have. You get fired for some reason you shouldn't have. Uh, you know, I, I would say, you know, something might happen at the Olympics or in a sporting event where you should have won and, and it was taken away from you. Um, you know, you could be up 4-1, you know, going in the playoffs, 10 minutes left and lose in overtime. That was the Toronto Maple Leafs against the Boston Bruins a few years ago. That was for you, Marty Calder. Yeah, everybody remembers that. I'm a Habs fan, so I'm okay, but... How I met Jerome, I, I actually boxed him in the Nationals um, back in uh, 1989. And I boxed him in Burnaby and I made it to the finals and lost to Geronimo actually at, in the Bantamweight division. Uh, split decision, it was, it was a very close fight. And uh, so after that there was box off. So you had to go through kind of, uh, he was the champion. So you had to go box the other boxers that competed in that tournament and you'd have to beat them to, to go have a chance to compete against Geronimo again. So when I, uh, I boxed the box from Quebec, beat him and then I, I made it to, uh, to Geronimo basically, but I, the, the challenger has to beat the champion twice, so I ended up uh, beating Geronimo in Winnipeg twice. Um, and then the following year, I moved up in weight uh, to featherweight and Geronimo stayed at that weight and we both uh, won the nationals. And um, we competed on the same team for a, a full year and uh, it was awesome, but he was uh, um, a partier. I roomed with him a couple times too and uh, we go to the Commonwealth Games. Uh, Geronimo did really well. He made it to the finals and uh, won a silver medal for Canada. One of his first international, major international tournaments. So Geronimo was was great um, to be second silver medal and won a big competition like that was amazing. Bantamweight Geronimo Bai had an eye for gold, and with a combination of speed, power, and tenacity, he seemed destined to find it. But like four of his teammates, the battling little brawler from BC headed home with silver. 
you know, after the closing ceremonies, the next day we're like, okay, we're going to Indonesia now to compete. And there was a tournament there. We we're there for like five days. So we get there the night before. Um, we're, me, myself, and Geronimo are, are, are trying to make weight. Myself at featherweight, him at bantamweight. So I, we were a couple pounds over. The morning of, and we're talking about, like, what are we even doing here? Like, we shouldn't be boxing. We're burnt out. You know, we, we spent, uh, we were missing home. We're, we're away for over a month. Now we're in Indonesia. So we go in for the weigh-ins, and our, our coach, our head coach was Taylor Gordon back then, who just actually passed away. Um, so we get up, and I go on, and I was a little bit overweight, so I went and I trained it off and, and uh, made the weight. Geronimo uh, goes to step on the scale, and he is like three-quarters of a pound over, something that we're used to and that we can easily uh, lose that weight to get back. He taps Taylor on the shoulder and says, okay, so what does he do? Expect Geronimo to go and, um, and go train it off. He goes and has breakfast. He didn't, want to, he didn't want to fight. So he goes, and he's obviously over the weight class. So uh, basically, he couldn't fight. But there was an opening, not at the weight class where I was, not at the weight class where Billy Irwin was, because he was a weight class above me, but the weight class above that, which was three weight classes above his normal weight. So Taylor, trying to, I think, trying to purposely get Geronimo probably, you know, let's teach this kid a lesson, let's put him in, and we'll, we'll get him beat up. Well, doesn't he? goes, okay, Geronimo, you want to you fight in the uh, next, you get three weight classes up? He goes, I'll do it. He goes, I don't care. You know, Geronimo was kind of, you know, real cocky. He goes, yeah, I'll fight. So I think he weighed in with all his clothes and stuff. He goes, yeah, so he's fighting three weight classes up. Doesn't he draw this American Marine guy, this guy Butter? who he's a very slick guy, who was beating a lot of us guys sparring. So he goes in, Taylor thinks he's going in, he, this kid's gonna beat him up. Geronimo goes in, he's going in very, very slick. Geronimo hits him with the right hand and knocks him out. Unbelievable, and everyone was. We were just dying laughing because here's, here's our coach who's trying to teach him a lesson. And I think Geronimo taught him a lesson. Didn't matter what weight class he fought at. He, he had so much power in that right hand. He could hurt anybody at any time. So it was uh, a funny story. And it's just, it just shows uh, you know, the, the power that he had. Um, and I think he, he wanted to prove our, our coach wrong. You know what? I don't care how big he is. You know what? If I get this right hand in Atlanta, he's going. And, and with this butter kid, um, he knocked him out. So it was just uh, amazing. But that was the type of athlete that uh, Geronimo was, such a natural, natural athlete that had so many great abilities. Um, obviously, if he wouldn't have, uh, if he would have trained a little bit harder, I'm sure, and, and uh, kept his weight down low, um, he, he might have been an Olympic champion. Manny Pacquiao, he had that power even though he was right-handed, Manny Pacquiao was left-handed. He was so fast like, like Manny and uh, you know, he, he was a Filipino as well. So he was the type of fighter, he was kind of a professional fighter, so he would be like, you know, he, he, he kind of had a jab and he'd be like this kind of, and then all of a sudden he was just like, Zip! and he'd slip in a right hand and he wouldn't even know where it's coming from. And uh, yeah, really, really sneaky, sneaky right hand and he just, Jab, 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 you know, just almost making the guy fall asleep. Got him, and he, and he was fast, and he was dodging punches all the time, and then he just like get a right hand. And it was so quick that uh, a lot of people didn't see it. It was just uh, a really, really smooth fighter. Quick footwork, hand speed, and uh, he he had uh, he had all the talent. You know, he uh, he was a a complete fighter. He really was. Um, just the stuff outside the ring didn't help him. Uh, become a complete fighter, unfortunately. With his talent, and uh, it's, it's like, man, if he had any kind of, uh, uh, his training regimen was a, a, little, bit, <laughs> a little bit better, um, he could have been, uh, uh, you know, one in the record books, you know, being uh, a Manny Pacquiao type uh, in, in Canadian history. He really would have. If you throw a good one, too, you can win most of your boxing matches, and that's what Geronimo was good at. You know, he was good at just executing the basics, and then he had such good reaction time that it was hard to hit him, and he had amazing speed. 
he was never totally serious, but he worked a little bit. But I mean, some people just have different different wind or different uh, capacity to do things. Because if you're tense, then you tire out quicker. If you're nice and relaxed, then nothing bothers you. And that's sort of the way Geronimo was. In terms of when he got in the ring, it was all fun and games for Geronimo. Geronimo just, he just, he wanted to have some fun. He wanted to, well, even when we traveled around the world together in different trips, uh, Geronimo was just out to have fun and laugh and joke around and it wasn't, he wasn't, you never hear Geronimo talking about, oh, I wonder what this, what's going to happen in this match or that match because he had it all under control. When he wanted to, he controlled things so well. Well, the Canadian boxing team in the 1990s was a real mix of different people, backgrounds, a real ragtag situation in many ways, a real challenge for the, the coaches to manage. The funding from the Canadian Boxing Association would fund the trip, the food, you get a per diem for food, and, they cover, and the sponsoring country would put you up in a hotel and um, make travel arrangements, they get from hotel to the tour. So there's no cost to us. It was just, uh, but we wouldn't get paid either because it was amateur. So it was just fun to get developed and get better. Uh, so when you're an amateur boxer, amateur athlete in Canada, you go away for months and months at a time. Um, and especially in the early years with, with Geronimo, um, we'd go away to training camps and go to another tournament. We'd be away for six to eight weeks sometimes. And sometimes that's tough because you, you, miss, you miss your hometown you miss your family and your friends and you're out there and you're training and you're butt off and sometimes you get good results, sometimes you get bad results and but you have you have some great memories obviously with with your teammates and um, you know you don't really have a lot of money because amateur athletes in Canada are not well funded they're better now than what they were but back in you know 1990, 1991 we would make maybe $450 a month as an amateur athlete plus you're trying to work uh, or going to school and then training as well. So to go away for, uh, you know, a couple months, um, if you're living on your own, it's, it's almost next to impossible. I think they said 80 to 85% of Canadian athletes back then lived below the poverty line, uh, which was like 15,000 or 12,000 or something like that a year. Um, so it was tough, you know, I don't think we cared a lot back then about the money because we were, we were so focused on the sport and so focused on having a good time. And then Geronimo's uh, Insta says he's, you know, you know, he wants to win, but he's not a big hard trainer, loves to party, but loves to pick up girls. And he had a, he had a great, uh, great time. Wherever he went, he always had a great time. And I'm sure he learned a lot while he was traveling. And, and uh, he probably misses that quite a bit. Uh, like a lot of Canadian sports, boxing has uh been struggling in many ways, really reliant on government funding and whatever little sponsorship or fundraising it can get, it's not a rich sport and uh, has not been getting richer at all by any means. Yeah, I think, you know, as an amateur boxer in particular in, in, in Canada, you know, I think people box because it's not a, a big money sport as far as like joining a club or getting equipment boxing is basically you need your shoes you go down there they give you the gloves a lot of the times if you don't have the money they're not even charging the dues every month it's not like playing hockey where you're forking out thousands and to join a league and stuff like that um, it's a very cheap way to uh, to get in shape and to actually compete in a sport um, you know so someone like Geronimo who, who his family might not have been able to afford for him to get into a, a, a sport like hockey or golf or tennis or something like that, boxing was probably the perfect sport for him to join. And it's not gonna cost, a, put a lot of burden on a lot of the family. But again, once you're, you're in the sport and you're a Canadian champion and you're a carded athlete, you don't make a lot of money. So to make ends meet, you know, it's, it could be a little bit uh, um, hindering on the, on the family as far as like putting up money and, and stuff like that to go to, to training camps or, or leaving school or leaving work um, because he has to go away for a couple months. But they want the best of their, of their kid and I'm sure that's, that was Toronto's parents' idea was, you know, this guy has so much potential. Like we gotta do, I'm gonna work my butt off to, to make sure my son Geronimo has the best training and, and best possible way to, uh, to achieve his dream and try to win a, a gold medal.
we were um, we were friends with him. Now you see him at Kids Beach a lot, and uh, he'd always kind of like he was the king of the beach. You know, he just he knew everybody. Very social sort of guy, right? He seemed to be around all the time, and he was having a good time. And I don't recall him ever missing a flight to go anywhere. So he was, yeah, he, he was committed to boxing, and he liked it, and it gave him recognition. And I think he was good about that. Man, he was a fit, fit guy, right? And uh, pretty, pretty boy, kind of Filipino, and, and girls, girls loved him. Um, he was a kind of a flirtatious guy too with the girls and, and uh, the girls yeah the girls liked me I liked him sorry they didn't really like me to tell you the truth I was a tall skinny skinny guy from my weight class so he was like uh, the, the pretty boy of the team so <laughs> well we all we all knew Geronimo was smoking weed and stuff, but, but it's not a big deal. Like, he's just having fun. And, but then we'd always wonder, okay, once you get to the national team, you're gonna get tested every once in a while, so you gotta be able to curtail that as well, right? So that was a sort of a concern that I had in the back of my mind. But I mean, it's his life. He gets to do with what he wants. No one wants to tell you what to do when, you, when you're doing your own thing. And Geronimo was ca quite capable of taking care of himself, right? You know, party and drink a little bit, but nothing to that uh, 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 kind of stature that uh, Geronimo did, because uh, yeah, he went over, <laughs> over and beyond, I think, even on some of the boxing trips that we, we went on. And uh, yeah, there's a few stories that uh, I could tell you. We were going to Denmark and then Geronimo had uh, taken a, a CD player from one of the stores in the airport and he put it in Tom Gillespie's bag. So the camera saw him take it, and then the security was saying that he'd taken it, and then they searched him, of course, didn't find it, and then they searched us all, and they found the CD in Tom's bag, and then Tom go, I don't know how it got there, and then, uh, you know, Geronimo came clean, and then they just took it back, and then we were able to go on to our flights, but it wasn't a prank. I think Geronimo was taking the CD because he wanted it, but, you know, he's not a dummy. He's not going to keep it on his purse, and he put it in someone else's bag. Tom, Tom the bomb, and Tom, he's kind of a funny guy too, and it just, just the way it was, right? So, but couldn't prove it that Tom took it because they didn't have it on video, and I, I guess he went out of the, the view of the video for him to, how, how it got into Tom's bag, we don't know. I never, never noticed anything as far as uh, um, Geronimo using uh, drugs or anything. Like, we went out for beers and stuff like that. Um, but never did I see him do any kind of uh, drugs or anything like that. Um, you know, he he's obviously is in, into that uh, substance abuse and stuff now and into drugs, but back then I, I never really saw it. You know, there were circumstances, one circumstance in Africa where, you know, our heavyweight, super heavyweight champion, Tom Glesby, took um, heroin and Geronimo was with him, but Geronimo never took any heroin. and. Um, Tom Gillespie ended up getting suspended for two years, and, and Geronimo didn't, because um, he, did, he didn't use at that time. And I think, there, I think what triggered, I think, was not making his weight class at Bantamweight, you know, where I know he would have made the Olympic team and probably would have won an Olympic medal, if not gold, um, and then have him forced to move up to that weight class where it was just kind of out of his weight. You know, he wasn't tall enough. You know, he was going against long, rangy guys like myself. Um, and I think that's where it probably took a turn for the worse, where, you know, I'm sure he, he dabbled into marijuana and stuff like that, but I don't think he, he dabbled into the real, you know, severe drugs or whatever you might call it until after he didn't make the Olympic team. You know, we had some good matches and he, he's a, he was a great guy. He's a, he is a great guy. You know, I haven't, I haven't seen him uh, probably since uh, probably the, those, uh, those Olympic trials. And you always kind of wonder what happened to him. After unlocking his pub on a recent weekday morning, boxer Mike Strange pulls out a photocopied picture of the Canadian boxing team from the 1989 tour of Africa. Half the fighters in the photo are now dead, missing drug addicts or ex-cons. 
A couple years ago, John Stevenson, a former Canadian junior team boxer from Newfoundland, stopped by the Highland Tap to visit his old teammate, Mike Strange, a three-time Olympian at his Niagara Falls pub. We were telling stories and laughing when he said, did you hear that Geronimo's dead, Strange said? Strange was taken aback. Geronimo Bai was one of the most popular fighters on the Canadian national team in the late 1980s, early 1990s, and certainly one of the most talented. The highlight of Bai's national team career, a silver medal he won at the 1990 Commonwealth Games in Auckland, New Zealand. Bai had a spark. He was a rascal and his teammates loved him for it. We called him a shiny button, said George Angel Mattis, his former coach, and as a boxer he was magic. He was always up to some mischief, said Strange with a laugh. But the little Filipino Canadian also had a dark side, and after he left the national team, his life spun out of control. Of all the skill on that team, he was the guy that everybody thought, if this kid ever harnesses his skill, he could be a world pro, you know, like a, a world professional champion. To me, that's why it made the story so compelling, is because he wasn't just some average fly-by-night national team boxer. Was you know, once in a while would make a quarterfinal or something. He was something special, and a lot of guys on that team and a lot of coaches and stuff thought he would uh, he'd be huge, you know. It's unfortunate what happened. Well, I was given the Olympic beat at our paper about uh, probably about 1995, and I covered Olympic sports as a beat for 15 years. And so I would go to all the major games, Olympics, Pan Ams, Commonwealth Games, and I always gravitated towards the boxing team because I love boxing. Did a little bit myself, also wrestled, and I just found boxers the most genuine athletes you know but a lot of them have amazing stories to tell frankly a lot of them come from the wrong side of the tracks as we say because you know if you're like a multi-millionaire the last sport you're probably going to put little johnny in is boxing right but these guys are all awesome and i find boxing teams really reflect canada a lot because you've got a real diverse cross-section of athletes you know like you cover swimming it's basically all rich white kids i shouldn't not that that's necessarily a bad thing but you know what i mean Boxers are all, and boxers, the boxing team always came from all over the country, you know. East Coast guys, a lot of Toronto guys, you know, Niagara Falls guys like Mike Strange, guys from BC like Geronimo. Well, Geronimo first came to know who he was at the 1990 Commonwealth Games in Auckland, New Zealand. That was the first major games I covered. I got to know Geronimo as a, a kid who was, you know, just like a shiny button is a good nickname for him, as his coach called him and a really talented fighter. I was like one of these guys on the national team who thought that this kid is going to be Canada's Sugar Ray Leonard. And, you know, as he stopped making the national teams over the next few years, I sort of lost track with him. And uh, I didn't know he even turned pro. He only had like two pro fights, but... And then the next thing I heard is when I went to visit Mike in Niagara Falls at his pub, and he, he told me about what he had heard about Toronto, and I thought at that time, Wow, I mean, what a compelling story. Hopefully he's still alive and I'm going to write about him. And then it just dawned on me that not only was Geronimo sort of missing and apparently taking drugs, so many of the guys I had covered over the years were either dead from suicide or drug overdoses. So that I sort of incorporated that with the Geronimo by story. A former uh, teammate of mine, John, Smokey Stevenson, and he was doing a, a kind of a tour with his uh, wife at the time and he was going through west to east and he came to Niagara Falls to visit me at my bar and so we just kind of you know just very good shape too John and, and we're just talking about the old days and talking about different names who are here who's not and he goes oh did you hear Geronimo Bai passed away I'm like oh my god I had no idea he's like oh yeah it was something to do he OD'd or something nobody wasn't sh nobody was sure so, you know total shock and I ended up talking to Steve Buffery a few days later and I, I was telling Steve about it. He's like, no way. And I said, yeah. I said, I, I don't know if it's rumors, because I heard s some people said they saw him. So s Steve wanted to do basically an article um, about you know, people who have, who have passed away. He did this article, and there was about three or four boxers that had died because of overdoses, um, suicide, 
uh, there was a few and results because they didn't make the Olympic team and I think it's uh, quite a shock to someone who should be at the Olympics and because of whatever it may happen they might have uh, lost or weren't in shape or got ripped off on a decision or whatever it may be didn't make the Olympics and you see the effect of not making the Olympics on their life and there was three or four boxers in that article that Toronto that uh, Steve Buffery from the Toronto Sun wrote about and um, one of them was Geronimo so Steve decided to, for him and a couple other guys to go out there and, and try to find Geronimo. So he went out there and I was, I was excited to hopefully, you know, they can find him. It's probably one of the the, the worst areas in North America uh, in many ways, yet some of the people that live there love it. When Steve Buffering and I were looking for him back in 2011, uh, we found him uh, not in, uh, not, not mentioned within the context of boxing, but really mentioned in court. Uh, that's where we found his name. That's where we knew at least that uh, he had been alive and was still alive and that there was hope that he could be found because going through the court system and uh, over a couple of days uh, Steve and I went down to the downtown east side just to look around just to ask around uh, uh, people on the streets the street corners uh, people uh, living tough lives down there people uh, doing things that uh, were illegal essentially drug dealers we, we asked not all of them were very happy to see us and not all of them really wanted to speak to a reporter Unable to find anyone who knew where Geronimo was that day that we went looking around, but got a lot of color about what it is like to be in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Very tough streets, streets that uh, Geronimo by now knows very well. There was a coffee shop that people said, oh no, I served Geronimo uh, yesterday. And uh, I guess one of the guys that was with uh, Steve thought he saw, or Steve thought he saw Geronimo, but I think called out his name, and, but uh, there was no response. I talked to Manny Soberl on Facebook saying, you know, Geronimo is, is alive. I'm like, what? I used to see Geronimo in the 90s because he, was, he had a couple pro fights, but he was deep in his addiction by that time. And he was here and there and didn't really develop a pro career. I think he only had two professional boxing matches, but he's a lot better than that. And, but then he was addicted to all his other things. So he just, you know, that overtook his life. Well, I would just see him on the street or I'd see him at boxing shows he'd turn up to in the late 90s and he was happy. And, but when I ran into him again now in 2013, he's still happy and jovial and unfortunately he's missing a lot of his teeth because of the, the, the addiction that he has. And, but he's still a happy-go-lucky type guy, you know, like not quite as vibrant as he was in the 90s, but, uh, you know. That's 15 years of your life, right? So he's not as young, and, but he's still happy, it seems, and he tells me that he's happy. He's happy with his life. Fast forward to 2014 or 2013, he's still living in downtown east side, and it's just a matter of me connecting with his mother, and I was, she was able to tell me where he was when I last seen, and then I was able to go down there and, and hook up with him, and that's how we reconnected. Yeah, his mom. But no, his mom lost times of when he didn't know where he was too, but now she just happens to know where he is now. I did not think he was missing. I just hadn't talked to him. So like I would go, when I saw this article about him, I was like, okay. I, I, I would wonder sometimes if he was dead, but I wasn't thinking he was missing. I was thinking sort of like, it's either what it was, which was he just, didn't want to be seen or didn't care to bother, had lost his phone book or whatever, and just wasn't calling people. He was here, he was around. If he wanted to be dead, then I would accept that because I think his life is hard. He never go missing. They just think he's missing because, you know, they cannot find him. They don't know his, we don't know, they don't know his, our phone number like that. That's why they think that she's missing, but she's never been missing. He always with us. Whoever, maybe in the gym, they say he's missing because she never, she stopped going to see them. 
I go in the gym, so they think he's missing, but he's around. He's with us. I don't know if she's been to the Stanley. She definitely went to the place off Victoria, and I've talked to her when I was there too, and she says things like, oh, thank you for calling Geronimo. <laughs> I'm like, no, oh, it's no problem. Like, I'm calling him because I want to. And she's like, oh, she, she's just very sweet. Uh, she answered the phone a lot when I used to call back in the day. I don't know if she's been to the Stanley. I was willing to give it a shot, but uh, I, I haven't because the last time I saw him, or the only time that I've seen him when he's there was the time that we went to the fights with Manny. But I've heard about it because I know other people, another guy who has a brother that lives there, and then there's another guy in there that used to box at the Astoria too, but it sounds like it's really hard I like. I said to Geronimo, um, are there any rules there about, you know, uh, drugs and things there? And he goes, like, you can't do drugs? And he goes, no, 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 it's for drugs, man. You just can't fight. They don't like that. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> but it does not sound like a place where people would be getting any better from anything. Good. I was on there. Oh, Peter? That's my dad. He looks like a Filipino Elvis. He's a father there. See? I don't want to come up here. You want to come up here once you don't like it. No, it's too kind of scary. It's really Filipino. I call it Star Trek. It's a Trek, but I call it Star Trek. Wait, and the sharks? No, the sharks are right there in the. You can't see the sharks, right? They're not here. They're inside the gooseneck. See here? See the gooseneck? What's happening? Yeah, they're doing, they just have taken camera and put it in my room and uh, stuff like that. I know, I know, I'm really full. I ate too much. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. He's a nice guy. Yeah, I think he's, he's friends with Ray Portales. Maybe he's the uncle or something. Hey, you gonna try to get down here tonight, Norma, or tomorrow? Uh, okay, no, yeah, a little bit, maybe. No, I'll just wait till tonight then. Okay, I'll get my own. It's okay. Okay, I'll just give it to you some tonight. Okay, so I'll give you, I'll give you some money tomorrow for the car. Yeah, I'll give you some money for tomorrow for the car. Uh, yeah, of course. I'll marry you. Okay. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll call you. I'll call you in the morning at uh, what time? Nine thirty. Okay, bye. Tell Ken. Tell Ken. Lauren said I did. Okay, bye. Yeah. I don't really have. It's not that I don't have time to talk about it. It's just I don't know if anybody really wants to hear that kind of stuff. But hear about it. Maybe some people would, but not everybody. It's just a different thing because they're not used to it. They don't know anything about it, right? So they probably pick no interest in it or they find it boring or stupid, right? You know what I mean? It's to crime and the drugs and whatever it would be. And other experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I went to detox. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and we have some of it was jail, being incarcerated. And jail would be the word incarcerated. If you get to medium minimum or medium security, you can get drugs. 
uh, you know, somehow to uh, to laundry or to camp or because you get outside gangs where you work, people come drop it off and stuff like that. And in the, in the institutional world, you can get it in there. Even, even medium security, you can get it. A Surrey, Vancouver. I was in Pretoria, Wilkinson Road, out there. I was in Prince. I was out. Uh, yeah, I was in a couple of few jails. Surrey, uh, Colony Farms. You know where Colony Farms is? In Coquitlam. I was there. <laughs> I was in Coquitlam jail. Yeah, Maple Ridge. Coquitlam. So, yeah, Vancouver here. And also, all through my years, I did 18 years in and out for 18 years straight. I didn't do 18 years solid, I did 18 years, I'd be out for a couple months and I'd go back in for 18 months and I'd go back in for a month and I'd go for a year, then six months, I did that, 18, 18 years in and out for there. It got really old for me to go in jail and do the same thing, because you only learn so much institutionalized, right? You get institutionalized, you only, they only get to do so much, you get to eat, sleep, drink, go out, walk around, you go to jail, you can't go anything else, you can't, do, you can't go out to a nightclub, you can't go out to eat. You can't go out to a girlfriend, you can't get a girl, you can't, you know what I mean? It's too much restriction, yeah. You're restricted, you got curfews or whatever you want to call it. There's no uh, drugs, there's no drinking. You can make your own, own, own booze, whatever. You could probably get drugs in there, but it's not the same. You can't call your dealer and say you want some more. You can't call an escort and pick up one and bring her home. Yeah, it's pretty hard. I swear you get people get crazy in jail. They become, they become a whole different person. Some people, they ruin some, some people, they learn from it, and some people, they don't. I wouldn't have gotten high, really. I wouldn't have known not to get high before the tournament. Before, a couple of days before the tournament, I would have stayed clean for those two weeks, for sure. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't, if I would have known there was drugs, there's no way I would have did Of course I'd want to make the team. Of course I'd like to play, get a medal and start the team. Then I would have, too long, I didn't realize that. It just never clicked to me then. I, didn't th I never thought about the drugs. I just didn't, because I never did it for a long time, except for the Commonwealth Games. Even then, the Commonwealth Games, I was, they were serious about that, but I was, it was weird now. I really wish I didn't do it, kind of. But it happened, so I don't want to draw on it, right? Yeah, I would like to continue to make it for my family, because that way, if I did get better, then I could do save it, make it easier for my brother, my sister, and my mom, and my dad. I don't really care about my boxing money. I just do that for the money, so that way it could make it easier for my family. That's all. That way, that way, make it easier for my family to live. Wouldn't have to go to work as much, and, Worry about stuff that they could do without, you know. I mean, get the bills and all that kind of stuff, and have a little time to themselves and see what it's like to travel. Traveling is the best, one of the best experiences in my life. You know that. You get that experience to travel and learn from the traveling. Oh, buddy, you can't beat it. It's priceless. It's expensive though, but it's nice. You meet some good people. You do you do some good things in different different countries that you wouldn't do here. There's probably things you could do, but different things, you know what I mean? You could tell he cares, right? He's, he starts talking about, you know, how he would love to uh, take care of his family and, and, and uh, you know, obviously with their money situation and that. And he wished he could have got off, uh, off the drugs and stuff like that. And he really still cares about the sport. And I think he, you can tell he regrets it too. You know, deep down inside when he talks to, about his family and about where he could have went and about traveling. Nothing in the world like traveling, and we had so many great times. I had about 12 years of uh, of traveling with with different teammates, and uh, you know, obviously Geronimo stands out um, because he was a, a guy who had so much power that was very unusual for an amateur boxer, more professional. He's my uh, buddy. I got into boxing. You know, I got into boxing. He's a good East Bounder boy. He's a real bad boy with a hard punch. And uh, I gave him that. I gave him the nickname Whiplash Pro because he hits you hard and never gives you whiplash. He was one of the strongest punchers. He was one of the stronger punchers on the uh, puncher on the team. Pound for pound, he hit the hardest. He had a mean, real strong right hand and a good left hook. He got uh, disqualified from the team for being a bad drunk and causing trouble. And I got disqualified for two years for being uh, using uh, narcotics. So we both guys, the only guys who got disqualified on the team were both from BC, me and him. He got, he got, he got banned from the team for two years for Jim, Jim Worrell, my he buddy Jim. got banned for two years? For Jim Worrell, my buddy, the guy who's from his van. He got it for drinking and being alcoholic. He must have been choked, I got for eh? drinking, yeah. He must have been mad that he got... Oh, he, he wrecked the fucking, uh, in the ring tournament in Quebec. He threw the chair at the fucking judges and everything. After the, after the match? Yeah, match? and I, because he was so hammered and I got, and I tried to find out I failed a drug test, he threw up 10, 9, 2, and we both got disqualified. 
And the only, really? two people, the only two people on the Canadian team got disqualified was me, and then we only got some BC. <laughs> yeah. So um, he, he failed yeah. it for, for what? For drinking, being a drunk. Drinking yeah. the alcohol. Had disqualified for being an asshole. Yeah. Yeah. And they thought you were on steroids or something? Or? Uh, no, yeah, I'm really sure I was doing drugs. No, yeah, they just looked at you and thought, hmm, this guy's on something. Yeah. That's no good, eh? Mm -hmm. uh, how many times did that happen? Just once? Or? Just the one time. And then, just the one time? Because all the other times I knew there was, I didn't tell me there was, if I knew there was a drug that I was already for, I wouldn't get high to tell yeah, me they just had come. Yeah, they, that's why they, they surprised me. They, they, yeah. they told everybody, everybody on the team, but they didn't tell me. Yeah, they knew sure, I did yeah. I'm sure. Uh, Fucking was, assholes. Doing what? What were you doing? I'm sure there was lots of people messing around with stuff, though. Yeah, but I was doing chicks, Wayne. <laughs> You were partying drugs, too much. The only, you drugs, the only drugs such as the people who fought and uh, won. They, I think they were curious because you, your skills weren't yeah. uh, going down and you were still winning. They yeah. figured you were on drugs. Yeah, so. that's right. And they, knew what they, wanted and they to thought help. right away, what, what, they must think well, he was doing some kind of steroids or something. Well, why, well, they didn't realize knocked, that you were doing you know, just the regular yeah, thing, drugs. Well, how did they knock four guys out? Well, how did you do that? In a tournament where... They, they made the gloves where you couldn't knock people out. They yeah. made the gloves yeah. just for fun. Yeah, points. they did the best they could, right? The porn yeah. fighting gloves, but I yeah. hammered the guy. Yeah. So fucking hard, man. But I didn't even know where he was. Did you, 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 said that why, did you hammer When you hammered him like that, you knew you could hammer him. Yeah. Did you do it Did you do it because you you didn't want to have to go the whole four rounds? Yeah, yeah. why? Why do I have to? It's so lazy, man. Tiring, man. It's hard work. And this is your, your what fight was this your fourth? In Spain. In yeah. Spain. You were fighting Spain, yeah. Every, 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 every guy, nobody made it to the third round. Made it, made well, obviously they were wrong the about the gloves, round. eh? Made it to the second round, yeah. What weight of gloves? You remember? Uh, what are they? They're probably ten eight ounce. Ten ounce, yeah. But uh, wow. even, the, even the heavyweight guys and the other world's weight, none of them got knocked out. They really? People, yeah, I was doing mm. me and, me and my, my weight. It's the only the, knockout in that. Knockout in the tournament. That's why I got most of the tiny bucks in the tournament. One every day, four day tournament. Yeah, that's awesome. You, you listen to him, he's, time, he, he's timing when the uh, uh, tournaments were, where they kind of knew that uh, he was going to get drug tested, so he didn't take it. I, I wouldn't know, like, if it was 72 hours or whatever it was, but obviously he knew, so he knew when he could. Uh, uh, and these weren't performance enhancing drugs that he was taking. These were drugs like probably, you know, marijuana or, or cocaine or something like that, something that's not going to, you know, really enhance your performance might kill you like a cocaine but and it's just funny listening to him uh about how hard he punches and he was right he goes you know it was more of a point system so the gloves were a, a little bit bigger than than professional and but he didn't want to go three rounds because he it was hard work he even said it. he goes oh it's hard work because who wants to go three rounds so i can knock him out in the first round i knew that i couldn't punch hard like geronimo so i knew i had to go the distance most of the time change the pen first time i fought him i fought him in uh here and I lost him by three points, uh, split decision. And then I fought him again here this time, and I beat him. And then we fought again a third time, and I won that one. And then the last fight he won, so it's 2 2. And we've become really good friends, but now they won't, we can't fight each other anymore because he went up a weight division, he wanted to fight again. And, uh, and I won at that weight division. Now he went up a different weight division, and he, he won that, that division. We're separated, but we were real good friends, and he talks really hard. He talks hardly about me, and I talk about how we become good friends to put two fighting each other. It's a real good It's like a, the kind of fights we have are chess matches. We wait for each other to make the first move, or whoever makes the first mistake uh, will get caught or makes, making a mistake. I'll make you pay for your mistakes. Say if you throw a right hand and, and I duck it, then you miss. I'll catch you while you miss. It's like that. It's a counter punching. That's what chess fighters, uh, counter punchers do. Some guys you just counter fight. They wait for you to throw, and then they catch. after you miss, they you they throw after you. It was chess matches between me and him. You know, we were both kind of counter punches, so kind of waiting and waiting. I had a little bit longer reach, so a little bit of advantage that way. But he had the the power, so you always want to watch out, make sure he doesn't catch you, because he could uh, put you to sleep in one punch. That's for sure. The first match he won, it was in Burnaby, and then I uh, came back and won. Um, two boxing matches uh, to get me back on the team with the box offs, and then the next year. Um, I moved up in weight and he won the nationals and then the following year which was the Olympics he didn't make weight so he had to come up to my weight which I didn't want to fight him because he was a friend of mine and I wanted him to go to the Olympics um, unfortunately he didn't make the weight so he had to come in my uh, and that was in Regina and uh, we met in the finals and, and I, I beat him and then um, he won the box offs so he had the right to, to fight me again and that was supposed to be in Nova Scotia in Halifax but he failed the drug test, so he couldn't, he couldn't fight me because he was suspended, basically. 
Um, and then there was another guy who they were gonna get me to fight, Eric Grenier, and he failed the drug test as well. I, I didn't have to fight anybody in the box offs, so I automatically got to go to the North American trials where we're, the qualifications got tougher at the Olympics. You had to qualify through North America and South America. And that's where I won the bronze medal in the Dominican Republic to represent Canada uh, at the Olympics in, in Barcelona. You know, it's, it's, it's funny listening to, to Geronimo, but it's, it's nice to hear him saying, you know what, we had some good times and we're good friends. And that's more important than any kind of matches or fights or, or stories that maybe he thought or I thought. It, it doesn't matter. And I think that's the bottom line is, you like to see him do well, and uh, you like to, to talk well with each other. If, if I ran into him, I probably wouldn't recognize him. His face, obviously, is a little bit changed, just like me, I'm sure, right? I, you know, got the gray hair now, a little bit, a lot heavier now, and, and that. Um, and, uh, like, as far as banned substances, um, you know, they can range from diuretics, um, like trying to lose weight, um, and they're used to mask, basically, drugs like cocaine and stuff like that. But those, those are the, I think, he, I don't, it was either cocaine or marijuana that I think he got busted with uh, back at the Olympic trials in 92. In That's why he couldn't go to the box office against me. Um, but those are the type of drugs that, you know, automatically you're getting two years suspension. You're getting your funding taken away from you. Um, you know, there, there are circumstances uh, like where someone might take a, a drug that, because if they're sick, you know, if you're a car athlete, they can call you anytime. Um, and just say, okay, you got to go to the, down to the doctors, you got to get drug tested, boom. So any particular time, can is pretty tough, I think, since the, the Ben Johnson days of him getting caught um, back in uh, 1988, um, and that whole disappointment. And uh, so, you know, I, we're really tough um, as a country on our athletes to uh, keep, uh, keep the athletes clean. It's somewhere in 1991, 92, like that. Prince came home from New Zealand. So many people come in to want to meet him, like a, a friend. So uh, that time, she don't feel like going boxing no more. No, 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 feel like going gym. And don't feel like to compete no more. She just don't want to hang out to those people, like come and see him, you know, like ask him to go, can we go, like going nightclub, taking him anywhere. Like just a friend go out all the time, picking, they have cars, his friend come pick him up and bring him anywhere. So she lost, uh, she don't feel like going back after that. Because when she become well known, the same in the TV, oh, yeah. those kids wants to see him, meet him. So his cousin have lots of friends, wants to meet Geronimo. So when Jomo meet them, they become his friend. So they become like, okay, we go out nightclub and this, we go nightclub. Because they feel good when they're around with Geronimo, because everywhere Geronimo go, people notice him. Oh, hi, Geronimo, like that. She have a pre drink, they give him pre drink, you know, everybody wants to talk to him because they, 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 he's well known that time on TV. So since then, she don't feel like going back anymore. She started hiding to the, you know, the coach phoning him. She said, no, don't tell me I'm here. She doesn't want to go out. Because <laughs> when she's young, she don't. Socialize, you always devoted to gym, school, gym, like that. I got sick of it after. I didn't want to travel anymore. But it's free. Yeah, but you get tired, you get sick. You don't want to be on paper 18 hours. And then you get tired of sitting in a hotel. After five years, it was the best. I had a real good time. But the next three years, I said, no, I don't want to go. I said, why? You don't want to go? I said, no. So I sent, the, there's two team members, National A and National B. National A is the better team, yeah, and they get paid more. But I said, I said, can you pass it to the B team member? And then when the guy, B team member, Heard I said cancel. The next time I seen him in uh, training camp, he goes to him. Thanks, man. Thanks for what? He goes for the trip. Nobody ever gives anybody a trip. So I said, Fuck, I'll give you some more. He goes, really? Yeah, thanks, man. Thanks. Said, Go ahead. I don't want to travel him. I'm tired. I cancel trips, man. Nobody else would do that, but I would. I don't care. I don't want to go again. You get really sick of it, man. You miss your friends and you miss your family. No, but you get tired of it. Everybody gets you want to get, trust me, you'll get sick of it, man. You get sick of it. You want to you want to get to hang out with your friends, man. You're, and uh, stay home with your family, man. You want to see all the time you're there. Yeah, it's fun for a little bit, but no, you want to be able to relax and do whatever you like. Have somebody watching you over and make sure you make your way and do like that. You want to be able to, you got to always hide. You don't got to do nothing. I can do whatever I want. If you don't like it, fuck off, man. <laughs> when people give me a hard time with the cops, and even they don't give me a hard time at all. I got friends that are, that are cops that I went to high school with. 
one of them I wanted you to beat up because he arrested me, fucking asshole. Like that Jordan Lennox guy, he's a, he was a correctional officer, then he became a cop. He works for the SWAT team now. And that's the last time I seen him, they busted somebody on 49th Spacer. I seen him, and he took off his coat, and they had to but he took off, put his gun down and everything, and he came to drama. I said, hey, well, nice to go to him. Went out of his way to come and say, I'm because he's my friend, man. I grew up with him when he was a kid. He was 18. Now I was 20 something, and he saw me on TV. And we became friends. And then after that, and when I went to jail, he was older, like 23, 25. He goes, hey, you know that guy? I said, that's my friend. I grew up with him when he was he's a correctional guard. He was so happy to see me. But he goes, you're in jail? Said, yeah, but we were still friends without that correctional inmate thing. No, no. All the side, we're still the same friend. That's how I am. Good, huh? Well, Laura, Laura Cubitt uh, was very much a promising female boxer. Someone who was also a trailblazer, uh, fighting at the time that she was fighting. I mean, boxing is one of those sports that's uh, an all boys club, but it's quite positive to see others taking up the sport. I mean, she was someone that, as much as there may have been some chauvinism expressed because of the old boys club nature of boxing, it actually helped the sport get some more attention. And uh, that helped all boxers sort of lift uh, lifted the Vancouver scene up temporarily while she was out there competing and uh, winning matches. I was 18 when I met Geronimo. And so I think, I can't remember, I probably, yeah, so I met him before I had my first fight, I think. I had heard about him already and, or when he walked in, then people were like, oh, that's Geronimo. But he's very, he's got a magnetic kind of personality and he likes girls. So he's like, hey, he started talking to me and then he helped me out. He did hand pads with me and taught me some things. And he was probably high at the time, but he was still quick and good. So yeah, we started talking. And then I think we exchanged phone numbers really close to then and we would talk, he would be the last person that I'd talk to before I'd go to bed for a long time. And he was just easy to talk to. Oh, he had a lot more years experience, but he wasn't really in the gym then. This is like, I'm 18 and he's 28. So it's been like 10 solid years since he left boxing. He'd still come back to the gym and he could still train. Um, he's pretty amazing like that. Even his reflexes were really good. He could spar if he wanted to but he wasn't really boxing anymore. It was more of like a hobby right. when he felt like it. I met her when I first started boxing. She was there, she started, and I was there boxing at the time, and I guess she kind of fell for me, and then I got, took her under my wing, and we started hanging out, and I taught teach her how to box a little bit, and she got good, real good, and we started going out, and she became Canadian champion, and then we got help. We were dating for a couple of years, and then we just woke up. But yeah, we're still friends now, and together, she then we just went separate ways for a long, long time. We didn't see her, and we, we connected a couple of years ago. I mean, just last year, and she she got in this, and that's it. No, I wouldn't have married, but I could be a friend for life. Though she was in love with me, she said. she told me she fell really in love with me. That's she would have married me, but I was was at the time I was too. She was too young. I was she just finished high school. She was only 19. I was already 21. Or 25 or something. Yeah, she's a nice, real nice girl. Good look, well brought up, you know. She got a bit of bad, bad girl in her, but she's a real good girl. She feels nice and smart, funny, good sense of humor, and tough as hell. She's a real good fighter. She's tough and rich. Good talent, and she, now she does yoga. She's got nice teeth, no cavities. Yep, nice figure, does yoga, and yep. I mean, he spends a lot of time alone, even if it's like downtown's pretty much alone. The Stanley is apparently a real place to be. Um, but I mean, he's spent like over the last years, I spend a lot of time alone, but spending time alone tripping out on drugs is an entirely different world of alone. Oh. oh, you're a mess! No, no. I fucking knew it, he's just not used to you. No, I, I had to go do the thing. I had to call everybody trying to come straight. 
we were, we're looking for you. We're not allowed to go in. Why not? Because we're not allowed two people at one time. Fuck them. I can't have them to be. Right here already. Who said that? Come on. The girl. The girl. The girl with the brown hair. But I think she left. Yeah. All right. What? I got a little bit of 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 a little bit Where was he going? Oh, come on. Oh, no, good, no, good. Just put it on. Get no, she's got no cabbage on you. What do you want? She's proper. But it's hard to find proper girls. Yeah, I'm are you on the look? The hard, no, the hard. You're not in the right area. I'm not in the right position. Uh, yeah, right area, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to see. It's a little girly, but I, I think I can. How are you going to make it like that? Japanese people, how do they yeah. make it? Where's like your that? brush? Can you pass me? Did you cut your, yeah, you keep your hair. You said one good. Don't think I'm still right now, but it's okay. It's all good. If it wasn't, I'd be eating total on the bottom of the buck. I'll show you how much it is. And it will last a few hours, but it kills every pain in the body. I'll be a scientist or something. What do you call us? A chemist. How long are you doing this? But for you're science? not mixing. <laughs> what? I'm mixing. It's not like you're doing a big mix job. I know. It's just fucking narrow. Well, I'm making something, yeah? No. Yeah. That's right. Well, I'm just going to put my arm, I mean, my neck, my arm, anywhere. I, I would get somebody to fix me, but you want me to fix it? Uh, nightclub, or I mean, like a gang. You do it in a minute. I, but I just tell them I'm diabetic. It's not heroin. This is uh, sugar. I mean, my sugar bags. Brown sugar. <laughs> Mother <cracker>. Sugar mama. <laughs> no, I would rather use this. You know, only my hands black here on Laura because remember my floor? It was really bad black and white and chips of paint, so I painted it black so it's solid. Mm. It doesn't look so dirty, right? When it's all black and white, it's all, it all looks like dirt. When you were in where? I was in a box. Oh, no, I know you did them back then, but yeah. I thought you stopped. For I did stop for a while, but then. But when did you restart? When, uh, when uh, a couple years back. I kind of like when I moved, my little brother passed when away. When your brother died. Yeah. I knew it. Well, how am I now? What are you supposed to do? Well, you I know it's hard. Yeah. I know, but you know what you do. I, I die. I, I can't do that. I can do other things, but it doesn't make me. One time he slept over at my place. Like we were like, we hung out all the time. Like he'd have sleepovers and hang out with the family. Um, he, the, he was like, I won't do drugs if we're gonna hang out. And I was like, okay, cool. Cause <laughs> like you're weird when you do them. And then I took him home and dropped him off. Uh, the next day, and he didn't. It was totally fine. But then I went to into his place, and he was like, "I really, really want to get high." And I was like, "Okay, well, I don't care. Just do it." Because I don't know. I was like, "Well, maybe it won't be that weird." But it was like the smoke went in and it went out. And in the next breath, he's talking about. Uh, boxing probably just from being around me and that my life that was where my life was focused at that point and he was talking about like why did they have to kick me off Laura and I was like I didn't even know you thought about this shit and it's not like he goes on and on and then then he's high and I leave he does tell me that before his brother died he had been hanging out with him and every morning he was giving him a hug and telling him that he loved him because he felt bad that he had bugged him when he was younger, which is what brothers do. But it was just before then and then he said that he died and um, he didn't want to do, like, I don't know, he didn't say he did, that was why he wasn't doing drugs, but... He had pneumonia. Yes, he helped to carry the casket. Was there. Yeah. They suddenly she become sick that we don't know, and here the Ramo is uh, different in thinking how did it happen. You know, 
It's hard to understand life, eh? Life is, we don't know. But she's really sad. All, yeah, she's sad. Because she said, Mom, I, I cannot believe it's happened to him. And then I cannot, I, I, she said, well, I remember him is so quiet and don't have to get mad, not, don't make trouble, she said. So I miss him so much, she said. And every time I remember, she said, every time she come work, I always hug him and lift him up. <laughs> she always uh, joking around with his brother. We were there for two weeks, but then he didn't know that, well, okay, he wasn't feeling good and he didn't know he could breathe. Because I caught pneumonia too, I caught pneumonia in jail. Okay. But I knew there was something wrong with me, because I know, you know when you know your body? Yeah, you know you if feel. you're weaker yeah. and something like that. I've been sick before, but I've never been sick like that, I couldn't breathe. And I said, I can't walk. He said, no, no, you just want to do drugs. I said, no, doctor, you fucking asshole. I'm telling you, I know if I'm sick, and there's something wrong. He says, why? Because I said, I got to always have a bunch of energy, even if I'm sick. And he goes, okay, so he did it. I went there three times, twice. And then the third time I said, I mean it, man, I can't do anything. And I had two guys walk me down, and then finally, he, he listened to my heart, he, to my lungs, he goes, holy fuck, he goes, what? I said, what? He goes, you better go to emergency right now. I go, why? He got pneumonia. One of my lungs was full of uh, bl uh, blood. And he sent me to the hospital. He said, the hospital said, if you came another day, you'd be done. I said, I tried to tell the doctor that. He's a fucking idiot. He, would have got, he was so scared because he would have gotten shit for that. Thing that. But my little brother was too late. It already, uh, it, uh, what do you call that? It affected his whole body. It was too late. They couldn't get it. Um, they couldn't cure it. For his birthday or after his birthday, I came out. My mom was the worst feeling, man. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> And he split up my whole family. We used to all live together. Yeah. As soon as he passed away, we all went to way. My family, don't, we don't do that, man. We lived together for, we lived together for 41, 41 years. Then George died. And that was a lot of us got together boxers from, you know, over the years, George had affected a lot of people. So we're getting together and I haven't heard shit from Geronimo in days. And I'm talking to another one of his friends from like he's known Geronimo longer than I have that he used to hang out with him when he was even younger. This guy Parm and he and Jimmy were together and they were gonna come to George's thing but no one had heard from Geronimo in a couple days. And then I find out on the day of George's thing that Geronimo's been picked up down the street because, I mean, most of the cops know him but it, they have picked him up and told him that he looked tired and he should check into somewhere. So this is before the Stanley. So this is like, this is September of 2013. So he has to like, that's what he had done. So he'd gotten so fucked up that he's walking in the streets and they're like, okay, we're going to check you in. So he missed the whole thing. And he still likes things like that. Like he likes to see us and stuff. So um, so then it's like, you know, I'm, I, I'd really try not to get attached to his fluctuations because it's it's just like anything else. It's, there's going to be an app, but I pretty much know there's a down coming around the corner. It's not that I don't expect there's another app. It's just kind of like, oh my God. You, like, I just, I, yeah, I guess it's just like at some point it broke my heart and now it's like I'm not doing that anymore. So, but he's just, oh man. He's the original box. He ran the whole place. He's the best guy, my best friend, man. He always thanked me. I go, why are you thank me? He goes, because you, because of you, I had to travel the world. I go, why? You made the team, man. And he didn't teach me how to box. He just kept me in there. He goes, you learned everything on yourself, man. You're your own coach. You learned everything on your own. He goes, I want to thank you. I go, why? Because you, you got me trips around the world. I can leave my wife. <laughs> He's my good friend, man. My name, when he passed away, I didn't know. I had never made it to the funeral or anything because I was in the hospital. I missed it. He passed away, yeah. I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't know where I was either. I was in the hospital. <laughs> it was too late then, but then uh, it wouldn't, his wife wouldn't let anybody see him. She was, she's a miserable Chinese. She's, I don't know, what's wrong with her. Sixties maybe? His whole body gave up. Couldn't hold his, he couldn't hold his valve. He got a valve to him out of, out of nowhere. Oh, he was a lawyer, then he became a judge. Not bad, not much. I, I said you can get that, but I really? got it. Yeah. Why? Because okay, you, you, okay. I think you take care of yourself a lot better. I, I think I take care of myself a lot better. I know better you do. That's I why know I you do. My fucking teeth. <laughs> I know you do, man. She's good. Fuck. <laughs> Hey, Remember you when you said to me, um, oh, really? You've never had a cavity? Yeah, I didn't believe you. I really didn't believe you. Look at it. Open it. And the brain won't stick out, right? But this can. Some people have natural veins. It's Turn crazy. your head right over, too. Okay, like that?
Yeah, right over. There. Goes right, buds goes right through it, right here, right? Three seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, jail. Oh, and, uh, cause, jail. Oh. Yeah, because you wanted to or because no. you ended up there? I, I know to. you've been sent there. Yeah. It's hard to quit. I know. Did you ever quit anything? Oh, you quit drinking? Eh? Oh, no, you didn't. Well, I drink sometimes. Yeah, drinking's not a hard thing to quit. Yeah. I quit totally, you know. But did you want to quit? Mm, no, or you quit. Or do you just you not quit. want to say you want to quit? No, you because quit drinking. You, do, no, you quit drinking because uh, then it doesn't fail. make you quit with the other one. No, I quit drinking. No, no I know problem. you quit drinking. Yeah. You walked in and you did it for a long time. <laughs> it's not you hate it or anything. You just want to drink when you're tired. Yeah, That's but that was so long ago and yeah. you've been doing the same shit. Yeah, I know. But now I'm, I just I, I enjoy life a little bit better. But you Content? Content. Content, yeah. Content, happy. Like Manny says, are you happy? I said, yeah, I'm happy. Whatever I do, I can be happy at doing it, whatever I want to do. You want, I wanted to take him to that story, but you ever been there? You like it? It's not bad, huh? You talk to Terry. Yeah. Terry's a real still. Why? Oh. Because you and your friend went down there recently? Yeah, there's sometimes that she got overdosed, that's all. I can say. Yeah, so this makes me worried all the time. Every time she goes out, I'm always worried me something happened to him. That's all I'm thinking all the time. Till now. She almost didn't make it, the doctor said. When you're in the hospital, the people the hospital, they said, how come so many people here? They said, so much people and no more visitors because so many people know him, they'll come. Even though they live in Zurich, they okay, they'll come. They come and go and see him in the hospital like that. When they know that he's sick, something like that. Because yeah. Jerome is very, like, friendly. Like, very friendly. You know. Even though he don't quit, but he can control it, right? Before, it's uh, really, really bad. And sometimes I ask his friend, I said, you guys hate Jerome? Because you know, sometimes you don't come and see him. She said, no, he said, we don't hate him. Only just because when you know the way he does, we don't do it. But we love Jeronimo, they said. I don't know how to say what happened to him. I never thought it was gonna happen to him like this. So I don't know whom to be blamed. The people who come in the house or him or we, I don't know where to blame. Because I remember Jo Mo when she, she joined in John Oliver Young. She, when she, she comes sometimes, she said, Hey, mom, don't smoke. It's not good for you. The cigarette. But I never smoke in my life. Don't drink, nothing. So I never thought it was going to happen to him. Because she always used to tell me the thing, don't do this, don't do that, like this. Not good for you, something like that. For how many years? Since 1992, somewhere like that. Until now. So Dr. Bueno said, when I talked to Dr. Bueno, I was, sometimes I go there without Jeromo. He said, don't get upset. Why? I thought Jeromo is, I never thought Jeromo still alive till now, she said. Because the way he is, right? They might think overdose for sure, right? Maybe Lord, I don't know. Because <laughs> he's a nice kid, maybe, I don't know. Because he always survived. There was a time when I said to him that I wanted, I really wanted him to get straight. And I was like, I'll go to the Philippines with you for a couple months. And like, maybe that will just be a different scene. Like, let's do it. And he said to me, I don't, I think he maybe said, thank you. But he said, I don't want to go because I like doing drugs. Um, that's what I like to do. And I was like, okay. And it wasn't like everything changed right then, but that's, Drone was very truthful about these things. And I think that now other people are like that with him and I'm not. Like now I understand that he is choosing these things and I, I can't do anything about it. That's how I retain my sanity. <laughs> Play with my cats. 
Oh, my name is uh, Alan Dennis Arsenal. is my full name. And I was a police officer for 27 years in the downtown east side. And then I spent six years teaching police-related topics at the Justice Institute of British Columbia. Well, the downtown east side is uh, approximately about 10 square blocks, I suppose. And uh, it's, it's centered at uh, Maine and uh, Hastings, or Payne and Wastings, as the locals call it. And uh, in that area, there's... Uh, uh, upwards of five, six thousand uh, intravenous drug users, and, uh, and actually quite a few of them now are have, have maybe switched over to smoking crack cocaine, or some are doing crystal meth. It's an area that's rife with with crime, uh, social disorder, poverty, uh, mental illness. There's a local uh, mental institution called Riverview, and it was downsized uh, three, four decades ago, and uh, they've turned out. Um, these uh, mental patients onto the streets and so the downtown east side has become a de facto mental institution and the police walking the beat there have in fact become sort of open custody uh, wardens prison wardens or uh, jail uh, jail personnel <laughs> and the people are wandering around there and uh, they're quite often the, the mental patients are not taking their medications and or they're using illicit uh, drugs to self-medicate, so to speak, and uh, the result is that there's a lot of, of crime and carnage g going down there. It's a crucible of violence and chaos. The loss of human potential. That's it, in one word, in one sentence, rather. It, drug abuse is about the loss of human potential. So uh, once people get that, then they realize that, geez, there's only one way around that, and that's to get either prevent people from getting dr on drugs in the first place or, or treating them. And somebody like, say, Geronimo, he was an aspiring Olympic contender. If he hadn't gotten drugs on drugs, he would have gone to the Olympics, for sure. And uh, even, even now, even though he's missed that opportunity, he can still make something of himself, but he has to get away from the poison, that which is killing his soul. It's killing him physically, it's killing his soul. You know, he can't live in the downtown east side, for example, uh, in this, you know, in that mess down there with all those triggers of needles and drugs floating around and crack pipes and, and just, he can't live in a Skid Road rooming house and expect us to get clean and be stay clean. It just won't happen. I meet somebody who they say they're in treatment and they're hanging around the downtown east side. <laughs> I know they're, they're, they're full of it because it just doesn't happen that way. You have to make a clean break and get out of there and don't look back. Uh, we're seeing a different kind of gentrification happen. We're seeing the downtown east side become a different kind of neighborhood and there's a lot of worries about where those people are going to go and what they're going to be able to do. Um, and one, one of those people uh, down there, of course, is uh, Geronimo Bai, who uh, uh, is like a lot of people there trying to figure out what to do next. The, the downtown east side is in prime real estate in Vancouver, and um, I don't think it, there needs to be a skid row. That's been manufactured through you know, poor decisions on drug policies and the, and the like. You know, I don't think they should all be clustered in one spot. Um, um, I think that these people should be assimilated into all the neighborhoods uh, throughout the uh, Lower Mainland. And uh, centralization of services like that, you can keep people enslaved there because they got, you know, there's no incentive for, for change and everything. So I think that, you know, people got to get rid of this not in my backyard uh, kind of mentality and, and and dismantle basically the downtown east side and and, uh, and just turn it into a regular neighborhood. They're doing that to some degree now. The new any new uh, structures that are going up there have to have some social housing. Great, um, but I think the downtown east side eventually will disappear over the next few decades uh, because the stream steamroller of gentr gentrification is on the roll. I mean, there's. No place that the central business district can grow. It can't grow into English Bay and uh, in into um, you know into the ocean. It can only sort of push eastward. Um, 
and it's already starting to happen. Leaving rooming houses in, in the conditions they are now with run by slum landlords is not, not, the way to, uh, not the way to treat people. I think if you have rules and regulations and, uh, in place, then people will respect the place a little more. If you say anything goes, because we don't want to be judgmental about your behavior, uh, drug-related behavior, whatever, well, then that's why you have rooms full of junk and garbage and crime and drug you know dealing and making and selling and you know it's just like it's just uh, if, if you have that free-for-all attitude if we don't care then you're gonna have the it's gonna bring out the worst in people hopefully someday the Toronto Mall can be able to tell his story to help others and maybe uh, impart some of his wisdom in the ring and, and his skills to, to others. Maybe there is hope someday that uh, his story can be told uh, in, in his own words and maybe even through this documentary it can help people uh, understand those issues better. Whether he, had a, whether he could have been a great pro even if he stayed on the straight and narrow we don't know but from what I had remembered of him if he had gotten a good coach in the pros and you know was disciplined I think he could have gone really far. I could see him at least fighting for a world professional title, at least. You know, whatever happens in boxing inside, you know, the ring, um, you're st still friends outside the ring, and I, I still consider him uh, a friend, and I'd love to see uh, him uh, bring some positiveness uh, back to uh, to himself and and, and get well. Um, but I, I really would like to see Toronto back on track. It would be really nice to see and. That would be the best ending possible for uh, for this story. Geronimo's done everything to his body and he's done pretty much everything he wants, but he's got no stress and he's living the life. When I'm talking to him, it's critical that I tell him I love him every time I see him because it's just like, I never know when he's gonna go and I know that um, his family still loves him as, and they're all there for him.